Great. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know that Town Hall has been an important part of the uh, intellectual life of Seattle for, uh, for, for years, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, even if it's inside out night. Uh, and thank you for finding this, uh, this, uh, this other place that, that, uh, that Town Hall is happening. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, the book has been out for over a year now, and it has received, as Will mentioned, uh, quite a bit of attention. That's been really exciting. Uh, but I haven't worn out yet. Um, and <laughs> so it's exciting to see readers and uh, people with interest in, in, in evolutionary biology and birds here tonight. Now, um, I want to start by... by uh, framing this work as a piece of bird-watching science, right? Um, you know, uh, the uh, physicist Rutherford said that all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And my, my tradition as an evolutionary biologist and, uh, and bird watcher uh, lead me to agree with him completely. And yet all of my scientific career has been dedicated to trying to transform uh, what people think of stamp collecting. Uh, and I don't mean just sticking them in the mountains. I mean the actual study of the individuality of, of organisms and species and, and groups, clades, as we call them, like birds or reptiles or, or, or vertebrates, right? And this framework for science leads to a whole different way to look at lots of topics. In particular, um, much of science is aimed at sort of trying to discover uh, the law-like properties, the generalizable law-like properties of, 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 of things, whether they're, uh, you know, electrons or sodium atoms or, 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 or whatever, masses, bodies of a certain mass. Um, but there are lots of things in nature that don't follow laws, and we call those things individuals. And, of course, individuals like you and me or this Blackburnian warbler. But there's individuality is really a kind of historical means of existence, something that can't be defined but is only, can only be uh, indicated or pointed to, something that has a birth, a potential thriving, the opportunity to reproduce, and a potential or inevitable death. So included within these are groups like birds, or humans, or, or mammals, or dinosaurs, or other kinds of entities like homologs, my hand and your hand, hands, limbs, right? Um, um, uh, other kinds of historical entities include continents, et cetera, right? But, but individuals don't follow laws in the same way. And so each one of these places where you find individuals in nature require a new kind of science, an irreducible kind of science. It's not going to be explained away by physics or any other underlying science. So in my case, the individuals that I'm interested in are birds. And that individuality used to be just birds themselves, all the birds and then the different species. Uh, and this work is actually about a new level of individuality. What's happening in the heads of birds, right? So um, the more you know about evolutionary biology, the more likely it is that you're going to disagree with me tonight. And so I need to earn at least a little bit of your credibility. I'm going to start uh, at the beginning. <laughs> yes, that's, 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 that's me uh, in, uh, in uh, sixth or seventh grade there. Uh, Ricky Prum. I grew up in a small town in, in, in southern Vermont. Um, I think uh, those glasses, uh, they, well, they might be retro now, but they sure weren't then. <laughs> that's what you put a kid in. And, uh, the, you know, this picture is embarrassing in many ways. But um, the glasses are central, both to this you know, embarrassing picture, and to my story, because I got my first pair of glasses in, in fourth grade. And the world, which until that point was sort of amorphously fuzzy, suddenly came into focus. And in just a few short months, I was a bird watcher. And soon thereafter, uh, I somehow knew that I would be doing birds. Of course, nowadays, if a child shows any advanced or specific interests, you shower them with uh, information and resources. And in those days, it was just like, great, the kid's into birds, you know? So anyway, so I, uh, I didn't really know what that meant, but I had a life list, accounting of the individual species you've seen, 
and, uh, and, and uh, now I'm unfit for any other kind of employment. <laughs> right? And lucky there's a place for people like me and, uh, and in, in academia. Well, uh, it, it was interesting uh, because I actually didn't know a lot about what science was, the practice of science. But when I got to college, I realized that evolutionary biology was the area of science that was about the topic that I had found so interesting, the, the number of instances, the differences, the origin of species, and how they're maintained within, within the population. So this is me in, in uh, uh, recording bird songs during my graduate work in, 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 in the Andes of, as, of Ecuador. And then that's led to now to my very messy office where somehow uh, science still comes out. Well. Over my career, I've had the pleasure to be working on lots of different topics. Um, for example, I've worked on the physics of these blue structural colors uh, in this Katinga, and, and also the, the chemistry of those purple pigments that make the carotenoid pigments that make that beautiful breast patch on the, on the uh, banded Katinga here. I've worked on the origin of feathers, the development of feathers, and the origin of feathers in dinosaurs, the dinosaur origin of birds, um, uh, biogeography, the phylogeny of birds, who's related to whom, et cetera. And for many years, I thought this was just a lot of weird stuff Rick is into. I really didn't think I needed a central worldview, and why not? Why bother? I mean, I'm having enough fun as it is. Uh, but over the years, I realized that a lot of the things I was studying were related to one fundamental question, an important question. That question is, the, how does beauty evolve, the evolution of beauty? And in this case, I don't mean beauty uh, to us, for example, as uh, the kind of motivation that uh, drives science, my science anyway, studying birds like this. I mean beauty to the birds themselves and to the scientific concept that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves, that they are active agents in their own evolution through their social and sexual choices. Right. And so to, to start, I'm going to start with a, uh, a, a, a video to show how the, the enormous challenge of this, the, the, the breadth and complexity of beauty in nature. This is the superb bird of paradise. Oops, sorry. And uh, he is a polygynous bird. The, male, the female does all the nesting, and she's about to visit him at his display lack or his display site. She's about to land on the log. And what we see is this, is this amazingly complex display. That blue color is actually a photonic structure made with an array of nano uh, uh, size, nanoscale uh, melanosomes in the feathers. And then surrounding that blue area is a super black, this structural black material with microscale complexity where the light shines in and, and, and bounces around and never comes out. So, so this uh, uh, shows us, we could talk all day about just that one bird, right? But this shows us the complexity of beauty, the real challenge that science has ahead of it, right? And, and, and now I'm going to introduce my problem. And my problem is an intellectual problem. The fact that most people in my field, evolutionary biology, would look at that display and see that all those different dimensions of, of attraction, of beauty, of ornament in nature, are actually uh, uh, evolving because they encode information about quality, objective quality, quality uh, about that individual mate that, that, that individuals need to know. So this account of nature says that nature is bristling with uh, information, um, like uh, who are his people? Does he come from a good egg? Does he have a good diet? Does he take care of himself? You know, does he smoke? Or, or, or what is he smoking? You know, all sorts of things that mates might want to know, right? And somehow or other, the way my history as a bird watching, as a bird watching science, was connected to science led me to another, another view. And that view is that sometimes, or maybe frequently, or most of the time, uh, that's an empirical question, beauty evolves for its own sake. It evolves merely because it's attractive merely beautiful. But I think this uh, mere beauty is actually not diminished, but an enhancement. Because as we'll see, what it shows is that beauty can evolve in a way that demonstrates 
that adaptation by natural selection is not the only important force in nature, that animals and animal choices are actually, can actually self-organize in a way that transforms nature in, a, in an important way. Now, in order to do this science, we need to um, think about the subjective experiences of animals. And by that, I mean the, the play of experience, the cognitive events that are going on over time in the life of the animal that allow it to construct a world around it. So here we have, we can imagine the, the, the world uh, that a bat observes is very different from our own, uh, using sonar to construct a three-dimensional world, or the, the, the olfactory world of the mole, which is a, has a complexity we can't imagine. Or over here we have the more mirrored fish, which lives in murky uh, tropical rivers in Africa. And these, actually, these fishes actually sense the world with electrical fields that they produce uh, and then they sing, also sing electrical courtship songs that vary in frequency and tempo, uh, like music, but in a whole other kind of wave, right? So, of course, these are the far edges of subjective experience. Uh, we're going to be talking today almost entirely about birds. And birds, of course, are a, uh, uh, more tractable to study beauty because they communicate with the sensory modalities that make sense to us, like vision uh, and, and acoustics. So... Aesthetic evolution, uh, the topic today, is about moving aesthetic experience of animals to the center of our science. Now, in order to make this science, I have to, 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 to state explicitly what my goal is. And I'm really hoping to support or document the existence of a, a distinct kind of aesthetic evolutionary mechanism, which is an emergent consequence of sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. So whenever these three events occur on a heritable substrate, uh, or either genetically or culturally, then we will have we, a, a, a sort of a new watershed. And over this uh, watershed, we have a different kind of evolution, where the function of that component of the animal uh, or the plant actually exists or actually functions in the brain, in the perception of other individuals. Right, And so um, aesthetic evolution, I think, can happen with the foraging choices of bees. Exciting to know that the pollination weekend is coming up here in Seattle. Uh, think about the beauty of flowers, uh, the beauty of baby birds or cuteness to birds. Uh, parent birds come to the nest. They sense the baby bird mouths. They evaluate, and then they feed one of them. That's a choice. And as a result, birds evolve to be cute. Well, cute anyway to the parents. Right, um, as we'll see. And then most of today we're going to be talking about the aesthetic evolution of sexual ornaments through sexual and social choices made by birds. Now, uh, my goal is to bring beauty back into the sciences as a legitimate or core uh, issue in, in evolutionary biology. And to do that, I need to distinguish it from mere attraction or mere pleasure, uh, as aesthetic philosophers have had to do since the ancients up through Kant and up through uh, today. So to me, beauty, in a scientific sense or in a, in a definable way, is a co-evolved attraction where, uh, where the, the form of desire or the specificity of preference and the objects of desire have shaped one another over time, right? Where the correspondence between attraction and the thing that it's attracted to is not merely random, but has transformed one another over time. Now, these arguments are not new. They actually are core and, and central to the history of evolutionary biology, uh, but in a way that, uh, that uh, uh, well, has been, has been checkered at best. Um, this is Charles Darwin, of course, the uh, f uh, famous evolutionary biologist, founder of, the, uh, of modern evolutionary biology through his discovery of adaptation by natural selection and the great tree of life in his book, The Origin of Species. After writing The Origin, Darwin had a number of persistent problems scientifically. He had no theory of, of, um, of genetics. He had no uh, explicit stated description of the origin of uh, evolution of humans. And he had no theory of what he called the evolution of impracticable beauty. So in contemplating that beauty, like in this peacock's tail, he wrote to Asa Gray, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. And I think Darwin looks a little sick in that picture, don't you? <laughs> and, and I think that really captures the man, um, um, uh, an intellectual revolutionary in a very conservative context and rapper, 
right? And I think he, he would be described today as a somaticizer. He took, his, he took his intellectual problems and he turned them in. And he's well famous for having had a whole series of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, digestive problems over his Well, uh, but his, uh, in, 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 instead of merely sitting on his laurels for having discovered adaptation by natural selection, he wheeled around in a foxy way and created an entirely independent and new idea, which he published in The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And that was the proposal of what he called sexual selection, right? That component of evolution due to differential mating success. And he proposed that there were two mechanisms. The first was mating competition within one sex for control uh, over mating opportunities over the other sex. And so this is, includes the evolution of antlers and large body size, uh, instruments of control. The other component of, uh, of, of uh, sexual selection was mate choice based on, uh, on, on uh, perceptions by one sex of members of the other. And in his description of mate choice, uh, Darwin used explicitly aesthetic language. That is the everyday, ordinary language of art, art criticism, and aesthetic experience of humans. So he described uh, 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 um, uh, mating preferences as, as an aesthetic faculty, as a taste for the beautiful, uh, as standards of beauty. Now, over the century and more since, uh, this language has usually been seen as sort of, uh, well, some of Darwin's uh, doddering <laughs> weakness as he got older. You know, he was out there at Darwin House, a little isolated from the people, and he got a little weird. So, uh, you know, in, uh, shockingly, in Darwin's 200th birthday, just a few years ago, um, I don't know of anybody in the sciences who celebrated this element of Darwin's work, which was really the, the last uh, uh, more than a decade of, of, his, of, his, of, his, of his life. So he thought of evolution as, uh, or uh, made choice as, as aesthetic, about beauty. And then uh, he also thought that it was co-evolutionary in the same sense that I've described it. Uh, oh, yeah, he thought, sorry, like here, he was, the most refined beauty may serve as a sexual charm and for no other purpose. And by this, he means no other adaptive purpose, right? So th in this case, he's outlining that sexual selection is independent of natural selection. Um, he's also, his theory was co-evolutionary. Here he said, the male Argus pheasant acquired his beauty gradually through preference of the females during many generations for more highly ornamented males. The aesthetic capacity of females advanced through exercise or habit, just as our own taste is gradually improved. And here we see him describing uh, the interaction and how, how, how um, ornament evolves both I itself and in correlation or together with the preference. This is the core of Darwin's view, co-evolutionary and aesthetic. Well, uh, Darwin's, Darwin's model of the evolution of, uh, uh, of armaments and ornaments through uh, mating competition, essentially through male-male competition, was uh, so uh, congruent with Victorian culture that it was a big winner. In fact, the idea that male domination could describe somehow in a natural way the structure of the sexual world that they saw, I think really contributed broadly to the acceptance of evolution as, as an idea. However, Darwin's idea that mate choice, in particular female mate choice, was a force in nature, was a big loser, right? And uh, in, the book, in the book I described, the original critiques are uh, uh, absolutely openly misogynistic, uh, et cetera, right? There were many elements. They didn't imagine that animals could, uh, were, had the cognitive complexity to make choices, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, the main critic of this was uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, here the other bearded guy, um, uh, with, um, who was the co-discoverer of adaptation by natural selection, right? Uh, and uh, these guys were on the same page in, a, in most of their work, but in this element, they were completely different. Wallace was, uh, was uh, a, a strong critic of the idea of adaptation or of, of sexual selection, uh, mostly because Wallace was a special creationist. He thought that human mind uh, had been specially created by God and in, you know, inserted into humans uh, by, uh, by an unscientific act a creative act by God, right? And he could not abide any con continuum between humans and, and, and other animals, 
right? So, um, but in any case, Wallace's critique, criticisms of natural select or sexual selection were so strong and so um, um, uh, well reasoned uh, to the readers of the day that sexual selection disappeared almost entirely from evolutionary biology for almost 100 years, right? Really wasn't until the early 1970s, the centennial of the descent of man, that, that sexual selection came back to the mainstream. So Wallace was highly critical of, of, of sexual selection, but if we look at the places where he, um, uh, where he, he uh, was forced to admit that it could occur or might occur, uh, we see some very interesting, uh, well, intellectual traces. So here he says, in a, in a section of a book called Natural Selection, Neutralizing Sexual Selection. The only way we can, uh, in which we can account for the observed facts is by supposing that color and ornament are strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive. Now, this is curious because here we have the man who's credited with having killed sexual selection, and yet he's articulating in this sentence the uh, biological match.com profile of, of beauty, the idea that beauty is all about information, about practical information, right? This, is, this, uh, this statement, strictly correlated with health, vigor, and general fitness to survive, would be at home in practically any modern paper on sexual selection. Right? How, how could that be? Well, the answer is that his victory over uh, sexual selection was rhetorical. He took those elements of the theory that he didn't like and threw them out, and he took the elements that he liked, and he called them natural selection. And he said, therefore, we don't need any of Darwin's new theory. What was he throwing out? He was throwing out the aesthetic, the idea that beauty might be evolving off the ranch, if you will, uh, in a way that wasn't controlled by adaptation uh, or by natural selection. So Darwin uh, uh, and Wallace debated this until Darwin's death in 1883. Uh, Darwin never gave an inch. Uh, but Wallace uh, lived until the, basically the dawn of uh, World War I. And so Wallace, turns out, uh, had a predominant impact on, 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 on evolutionary biology. And here we see in a book uh, published in 1889 by Wallace called Darwinism, uh, he wrote, even in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist upon the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and therefore I claim for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. Now here it's been 130 plus years later, and I'm still pissed. <laughs> and I hope that you will be too. Because what has happened is we've been denied, both as a science and as a culture, uh, the actual richness of Darwin's own views and complexity, right? And what we see in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, um, in this quote is the birth of what I call adaptationism. The idea that adaptation by natural selection is a strong force that dominates all the important features in evolutionary biology. This is the same, same aspect of one science trying to explain away uh, something that somebody else work, works on, right? And here, it's the, in, I insist on the greater efficacy of natural selection. There it is, the fingerprints all over it, right? Now, um, so I think what happened is Wallace lost the battle over credit for the discovery of natural selection. But he won the war over what evolutionary biology would become in the 20th century, which was an overwhelmingly adaptationist science, a science uh, aimed at reducing the complexity of animals to a single, to a single force and, and, and the complexity of evolutionary history to a single process. Um, and, and so the evolution of beauty is one uh, more peace in this long, you know, long battle between uh, legitimate Darwinism and its complexity and the narrowness of uh, the Wallacean worldview. Now, at this point, in my, uh, in my talks in a more academic setting, I would dive into uh, a little bit of math and the origin of the genetic covariance between preference and trait in the Landy Kirkpatrick view of the aesthetic theory of natural se or sexual selection, but I'm going to skip all that. I'm going to give you a, I hope, uh, an analogy that you can repeat to anybody in the next week. What did you learn at uh, 
uh, at Town Hall. Uh, I'm going to compare the evolution of beauty or the value of beauty to the value of money, right? And compare the dollar and the peacock's tail. Now, originally, the dollar had value because we were on the gold standard. That is, the dollar had value because it stood in, in, in lieu of a tiny piece of gold in Fort Knox, right? And you could turn in your dollars for money, for gold, and, and because you could at any time, nobody did, right? Um, um, in this context, the value of money is extrinsic. It's not in the money, it's in the gold. Now, don't ask why gold is valuable, but that's another the whole problem. Now, today, every currency on the planet has abandoned the gold standard. From dollars to Bitcoin and everything else, there is no gold, right? So where does the value of money come from now? Well, in the memorable words of, uh, uh, of uh, economist Paul Samuelson, uh, the value of money is a social contrivance. It exists because we, together, share, invest some value in it. We create it through belief in this value, right? And so in this context, the value of money is just the money. There's no gold, right? So what does this have to do with evolutionary biology? Well, I think most of my colleagues in evolutionary biology are on the gold standard. They think that the peacock's tail is, 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 has value, is beautiful, is selected on because it is indicative of other extrinsic benefits like good genes or no sexually transmitted diseases or uh, better worms for your offspring, right? right? In this case, the value of beauty is not itself, but some other thing. And this is a way of taking and explaining away beauty as just another kind of adaptive utility, right? Now, the Darwinian view, in the Darwinian view, uh, do uh, beauty is like dollars and Bitcoin today. There's no gold. The value of beauty is itself. And that means that you know, nature can give rise to irrationally exuberant market bubbles. Uh, in this case, we call them beautiful birds. Right? Now, um, the, uh, the, um, the math I've all skipped is basically the details of how this social contrivance occurs. And if there are uh, uh, evolutionary biologists who want to dig into that, I'm, I'm eager to do it at some point. Now, um, of course, the Landy Kirkpatrick null equilibrium model has really been a loser myself as a scientific <laughs> uh, 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 organizing principle. So uh, I've worked it up in a new way. So now I call it beauty happens, right? That's my new, my, my new banner. Uh, and that whenever... Um, uh, uh, sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice take place in nature, then beauty evolves. It's the expectation and that, that, that it should occur. So this is the, the modern version, uh, I think, of the Darwinian tradition. Uh, so how should we distinguish between, as scientists, between Darwin and Wallace? Um, really, the new battle is over the empirical world. How much of beauty in the world is about honesty honest uh, uh, communication of quality, and how much of it is just uh, beauty happening? Well, in order to, to do that, we need to get empirical. We need to do studies. There's a problem now because most of my colleagues in evolutionary biology are, I believe, uh, like this little leprechaun here. And I hope to, by putting the leprechaun hat in on Wallace's head there, I <laughs> uh, hope you can never forget this association between the Wallacean view and the leprechaun. Well, uh, like leprechauns, um, evolutionary biologists, most of them today, are saying that the, pe the peacock's tail is like a rainbow leading to a pot of gold. And there in that pot of gold, there, see, we got the good genes right there, the double helix. Uh, I should put worms and uh, other stuff in there, right? Those are the benefits. The real reason it exists is because of the gold, right? And the, the Darwinian view is that the beauty of the rainbow is just a rainbow. It's just itself. So ask yourself if a leprechaun, uh, an evolutionary biologist, I mean, uh, comes up to you and says there's extrinsic benefits behind the peacock's tail. It's just like the leprechaun coming up to you and saying there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Well, if you see a leprechaun and he says that, what do you say? You say, show me the money, right? The burden of proof is on the leprechaun. Until that has been showed, the beauty of the rainbow is merely intrinsic. So this is the path forward in science. And uh, that's my best attempt to, to, to communicate 
the dry idea of you know, the null model. Beauty happens as the null model. What I mean by that is it's our expectation of nature until there's evidence to demonstrate uh, Wallacean extrinsic benefits, right? So um, um, that's, that's how we're going to change science. Now, now back, to, uh, back to nature. Now, this is the Argus pheasant, the great Argus. Uh, this is a, a, a six foot long, the male six feet long uh, pheasant in, in Southeast Asia. This uh, video is actually taken from a zoo because they're so, they're so rare. This, again, is a polygynous species where the female does all the nesting. And, and there she is, right? This little, uh, as we'll see, the little hen there. And um, now in a moment, we'll see that the male is about to transform himself in an extraordinary way. And actually, conveniently, now, what is that? Well, I think that, uh, fortunately, right here in the inside out sign, we have exactly what that is. <laughs> it's like a blown out umbrella. The male has opened up his, uh, his wings uh, and inverted those secondary feathers in a way exposing a whole array of, of spherical spots. And if you notice, these eye spots have a white highlight on the top like the shininess on a, on, a, on a, the specular highlight on an apple that tells you that it's round, right? Or, um, and it has, a, it has a black mascara smudge below um, that looks like the, the, the shadow cast by the ball. So these are three-dimensional structures. And by the way, if you look carefully, you can see the, the male holding his head behind his wing. Now, the first Westerner to see this bird uh, was uh, William Beebe, who was a curator of, 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 uh, at the Bronx Zoo. And he spent lives, uh, his whole life wor working on pheasants. And he went to Borneo uh, in the early part of the 20th century to try to see this display. He first put a, a, a hide uh, uh, by, the, by the display area, and the male was scared away. Then he built a tree house and scared away another male. And finally, he had his workers dig a foxhole in the ground. And every morning before dawn, he would get in the foxhole and get covered with brush and wait all day. And after doing that for a week, he finally saw this display, right, with the female approaching the male. And of course, he's having a religious experience, having spent, you know, most of his life dreaming of seeing this and then fighting the leeches and the, and the, and the mosquitoes for a week. And then he sees this, and he says, he looks at the female, and he says, um, he writes, well, I'd like to believe what Darwin said about aesthetic uh, beauty. That's the hypothesis we'd all like to believe. But I, it's clear to me that any aesthetic impact of that display has been wasted on that little hen. <laughs> right? And of course... I think in a fascinating way, this was both obvious misogyny, but it was also in particular kind of accidental reverse anthropomorphism. Of course, he's having a religious experience fighting off the leeches for a week, and finally he sees this display, and he expects her also to show some, some kind of equivalent uh, uh, you know, uh, emotional impact. But in fact, the coevolutionary view teaches us that behind every elaborate ornament in nature, there's an equally elaborate cognitive uh, construct, cognitive idea about what is beauty, what beauty is, right? And, and, and in fact, we should really regard her as being closer to um, uh, uh, an elite art collector or curator at a new gallery. When, you know, when they walk around the art, they're not weeping, right? They're, they're leaning back going, huh, what do I think of that? They're analyzing, right? In fact, uh, because of her choices, because of, in aggregate, the extremity of female choices, why there's so much, it's because she is so critical that this has evolved, right? So the sexual success in Argus pheasant and other polygynous birds that we'll be talking about is a lot like the income distribution in America today. Okay, so the top 1% of the guys are getting 50% of the copulations. And then the next 5 or 10% of the guys are getting most of the next 20, 30, 40%. And fully half of the males probably never mate in their lives. 
right? So it's that extremity that creates this, uh, uh, this complexity of beauty, right? Extremity of failure. This is similar to observing that most poems that have ever been written really suck, <laughs> right? And, and, and operas too, right? Because the ones that achieve uh, do so in an extraordinary fashion. Right, the 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 stringency of their of their of the aesthetic evaluation is so high uh, that they somehow hit this magical spot. So that's what these guys are about. So here's an in focus uh, view of the feathers. You can see the complexity of of these patterns. That specular white highlight looking like a, a shininess on an apple, and this and this a deep shadowy effect giving rise to an optical illusion, a three-dimensional golden ball. In fact, 300 of them floating in the air. But that's not all. It turns out, um, I think there's a second aspect of, uh, of, uh, of optical illusion here. In particular, uh, her, her tail feathers, uh, or the, his uh, wing feathers, sorry, start with small spheres at the base, and they get larger toward the tip, right? This is kind of a, um, what do you call it, a... Uh, uh, um, uh, it could just be merely be allometry. They're changing in size. But if you look at it from the perspective of the female, foreshortened as the female sees it, right, the, the tail feathers or the, the, the wing feathers, the balls are smaller, uh, or the smaller balls are closer to her eye and the larger balls are further from her eye. So they start to converge on 300 golden balls of the same size, right? They create an additional optical illusion. Right. So these are the kinds of details that I think the uh, truly um, uh, reductive Wallacean adaptive view of beauty are unable to, to grasp right? uh, the, 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 the true breadth of beauty. Now, here's another extraordinary aesthetic extremist. This is the, the club wing mannequin. This is a, a small bird in a family I've spent a lot of time with. Uh, and this bird in particular lives in um, western Ecuador and Colombia. The female does all the nesting, like these other polygynous birds, uh, and, and, and visits among various displaying males and picks a mate. So this is the male's courtship song. But what's extraordinary about it is that the male is singing with his wings. Those sounds are made by his wing feathers as he flips them open. Now, I first saw this bird in 1985. As you can see, it took us 20 years to figure out how the hell that works. Uh, I'm going to do it in brief today. Uh, here is the, this is the work of Kim Boswick, now at Cornell University, my former student at the University of Kansas. And, and you can see in this high-speed video that the wing feathers are oscillating over the back of the bird at 100 cycles per second. The sound is actually 1,500 cycles per second, right? And so here is the... Um, uh, the little, you can see the little pumping moves of his wings, and there is the, the gap between the two feathers, the, the wing feathers colliding on either side of the, of the wings uh, in the middle and crown out. So how does that work? Well, it turns out that this is a kind of stridulation. It's a, it could be called cricket-winged uh, uh, mannequin just as well. It's called club-winged because those secondary feathers are thickened uh, in, in, in an extraordinary way. Uh, and it turns out the fifth secondary has a blade bent at sort of a 45-degree angle, which reaches over and rubs against the bumps on the sixth secondary. So as they oscillate in and out, you can see that tip of that feather raking on its neighbor. So this is like a bow on a violin string. It provides a mechanical stimulus which makes that feather ring at the frequency of the sound. Right? So uh, this is amazing because this can show that beauty is innovative. It may be meaningless. It may not encode information. But it is actually innovative because the birds have been singing songs, vocal songs at this point, for 80, 100 million years, a really long time. And this bird has abandoned tonal vocalizations in favor of a whole new way to be acoustically attractive. Right? Now, in subsequent work, Kim Boswick has, has asked the question, uh, is beauty only skin deep? And the answer is no. In the club wing mannequin, in order to make the beautiful songs that females prefer, we've had a revolution in the anatomy of their wing bones. Here is a CAT scan of an entire specimen, and this is a section through the, 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 uh, 
the, the, the chest there, showing that the, the, the arm bones, the humerus, the radius and the ulna are all solid. Solid like, you know, like ivory. That's weird because every single bird in the world has a hollow ulna. Even, in fact, actually, uh, even T-Rex and uh, Velociraptor have hollow wing bones or hollow limb bones, right? Uh, So this is a feature of avian anatomy that goes back prior to the origin of birds and prior to the origin of flight, right? So in order to make this beautiful sound, the ulna, the usual uh, uh, rounded tubular flute-shaped ulna uh, of the birds had been transformed in the club wing mannequin into this extraordinary structure for the attachment of those unusual feathers to the production of this sound, right? Uh, and the, the calcium in that, in that bone is orders of magnitude denser than in its closest mannequin relatives. A fascinating thing. Well, um, most of my colleagues would imagine that this kind of costly display might just be another kind of honesty, right? Um, and how do we overcome that? Well, um, I, uh, I think one way we can do it is to ask, what about females? What about their wing bones? And it turned out to be quite a hard question to ask uh, or to answer. Uh, and I won't go into the details except to say, well, we did it. And here are, are this is uh, another closely related male mannequin with the typical flute-shaped wing bone or ulna, uh, the, 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 the trailing bone of the wing. Uh, this is the male club wing, and that's a female club wing. She has the same bumps, almost the same in large size as the male, right? Now, this is interesting because clearly the reason why all birds have kept this flute-shaped ulna is because it's the best design possible for flight. It's been maintained that way because of natural selection. So clearly the male is made worse off by his funky wing bones. He flies more awkwardly and uh, for sure. We don't have data on that, but I, I'm, I, I'm convinced. But that could be just the cost of doing business, the cost of doing sexual business, trying to display. But the female, the fact that she has these wing bones, is clearly uh, difficult to to explain because she will never sing a song. How does this work? Well, I call it the evolution of decadence because in this case, I think everyone has been made worse in the population through mate choice. Right? So um, why does this happen? It turns out that the wing bones begin to develop in the embryo before the embryo has become either male or female. It starts in the egg, and so uh, it's like uh, male nipples. Males have them because females need them. Right? Uh, but in this case, I think they come with significant costs. Right? The, the female has, crea- has, uh, has this wing bones that she will never be a, have an advantage. So how does that work? Well. Um, when, she's, when she selects on the male she likes with a beautiful song, her male offspring will, of course, inherit wing bones that are very odd, but also attractive wing songs, right? But it turns out her, her daughters will also inherit those awkward wing bones. They will be made worse off, right, by them. And yet um, um, that disadvantage, having every generation of daughters getting less and less adapted will be traded off by having every generation having sons that are more and more attractive, right? And uh, we've done the mathematics on this. It works. And actually, interestingly, there's no, th- there's no theoretical reason why an entire species couldn't go extinct as a result of this process, right? <laughs> Extinction by sexual selection, right? <laughs> Now, uh, I was talking to a, uh, a, uh, uh, a journalist a few months ago, and he asked me uh, when I was describing this, you seem kind of excited by that prospect, <laughs> You're delighted by that prospect. And I was like, well, maybe I am a little. I don't know. Uh, but why is this important? What, the reason why it's important is because when adaptation by natural selection and sexual selection are working in opposite directions, then that is when we realize that, that the Darwinian view of natural and sexual selection as independent evolutionary mechanisms that sometimes interact is, is intellectually productive. And that the Wallacean view, that they're all varieties of adaptation, gets in the way of our understanding nature itself. Right? And, 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 and that's a, 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 an important point. So at this point, I hope I've 
convince you uh, that the aesthetic agency of birds provides an informative and, and interesting view into uh, in evolutionary biology. But I now want to turn to uh, the troubling and difficult topic of duck sex. <laughs> but one that I, if I hadn't been prepared through studying the aesthetic agency of, 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 of birds seriously, I don't think I would have been capable of understanding uh, duck sex. Because now we're turning from uh, aesthetic agency writ large to what happens in nature when aesthetic agency, freedom of choice, is infringed by social or sexual violence. Because unfortunately, the sex lives of ducks is very troubling. Uh, um, um, but informative, and to me, transformative in a way, uh, and understanding the importance of, 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 of agency and subjective experience. In any case, um, I started working on duck sex um, uh, in my lab because of Patricia Brennan, now a professor. She came as a postdoc uh, from Cornell to work at Yale. And she's now a professor at uh, uh, Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And uh, she wanted to work on the evolution of, of, of uh, avian genitalia. And I thought, well, I've never worked on that end of the bird before. Uh, I'm sure I'll learn a lot. Uh, you know, more of stuff Rick is into, right? We'll just widen it. Uh, but what I learned through this collaboration with Patty was, as I say, really transformative. Um, um, so uh, most of the sex life of ducks is uh, what we uh, understand from birds in general. The females choose males, mates, on the basis of co-evolved displays. They have preferences for particular displays, like the green head and the quack, 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 etc. cetera. Um, but the... Uh, but the um, uh, but the, but the, uh, and they migrate up to the breeding season or to the breeding uh, uh, areas when the time comes. Um, but when they, when they breed, a number of other individuals in the population, males that are unpaired, pursue an alternative reproductive strategy of forcing themselves, uh, forced copulations, uh, forcing females to copulate. This is very violent. It can even be socially organized, uh, and it's very harmful to the females. They resist it in, uh, vigorously. Uh, they can be physically harmed. They can even be killed. And so uh, this is really an exploration of what happens when freedom of choice is infringed by, by sexual violence. Now, this is all made possible by the duck penis, which illustrated in this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, whistling duck from Texas. Um, now, the duck penis is a, a, a very weird uh, thing, but it actually turns out most people don't think that birds have a penis, but in fact, the duck penis is homologous uh, with the human or mammalian penis. That is, is the penis first evolved in the common ancestor of all reptiles and, and mammals, uh, and then was mostly lost in most birds. And birds are among the few, or, or ducks are the, among the few birds that still retain this penis. And yet it is very, very different uh, in many ways. Um, so uh, one of the ways is that it can be very long. So this is the pe penis of the Argentine lake duck. It's actually a kind of a uh, a diminutive duck with a very long penis. In this case, the penis is longer than the duck. So this is uh, in the Guinness Book of World Records for the, for the longest. Now, over, over the, the last few years, I have realized that duck sex is like a gas. Um, it will expand to fill any volume you put it in. So uh, I'm going to try to wrap it up here, uh, not get too much detail. But we do need to know more about the duck penis, I'm afraid to say. So um, the, it, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is unusual. It is usually it's stored uh, inside out, inside of the cloaca, the, 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 the rear end of the bird most of the time. Um, it is counterclockwise coiled. Um, it has... Um, uh, lymphatic erection instead of blood vascular erection. That is, the erection is instantaneous. And what that means is that intromission, entry into the female, and erection are the same event. Uh, the penis does not become stiff, but basically uh, corkscrews its way into the female. And then uh, it doesn't have a, an enclosed uh, uh, urethra. It has a sulcus or groove uh, that runs along the spiral. Uh, and then also it comes in, in smooth, ribbed, uh, toothy and even thorny varieties. Um, now, um, in, in, in science, we, we aim to change lives. 
uh, and the next slide will change your life uh, if you haven't seen it. So this is a, a high-speed movie taken at a farm in California where they collect sperm from ducks for for uh, hybridization, for artificial insemination among, among species. Uh, and uh, so uh, no ducks were harmed in uh, the <laughs> videos of these things. So um, uh, here we go. So uh, this is uh, uh, 500 frames per second. Uh, the male is here, and this is the penis emerging. And this entire process takes place in a third of a second, right? And you can see that the sulcus works just fine. Thank you. Now, I, I want to point out that um, we're using the metric side of the ruler here. So that's just to assure you that this is actually science, okay? These are approved <laughs> international scientific units. What's remarkable is that, um, that, that this is an everyday event in barnyards uh, or farms and that it took until 2010 for people actually to describe this, how this happens. Right? So uh, uh, there were lots of mysteries in duck sex. Um, so what did Patty find? Well, what Patty found is that the genitals are highly variable. On the left, we have a species of uh, female and male uh, that with a low frequency of sexual uh, coercion or of uh, forced copulation. In this case, uh, the, in, in when you have a, a few uh, or low sexual violence, the penis is quite small and the vaginal morphology of the, of the female is, 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 is simple, uh, a simple tube. In the case in this species where you have uh, elaborate uh, or uh, lots and lots of forced copulations, you see that the penis have also be very elaborate with elaborate surface uh, 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 structures as well. And you see that the, that the vagina has also evolved to be highly complicated. Now, what are those complications? Well, it turns out immediately on the entry in, you have a series of cul-de-sacs or dead-end pouches, right? Uh, and then above that, you have a clockwise spiral. And notice that the spiral is antisense to the spiral of the penis. So what Patty uh, discovered is that ducks have uh, an anti-screw device anatomically in their vaginas, <laughs> which prevent forced intromission during, during uh, uh, or forced fertilization during forced copulation. Right? Uh, it is an anatomical way to confuse and prevent intromission of the, uh, of the penis, or, 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 or at least limit it. Uh, how were we able to test this? Well, unfortunately, you can't uh, put ducks in a CAT scan or an MRI and get a third of a second event, at least not yet. So uh, we uh, went back to the duck farm with these. One of the most enjoyable parts of the book to write was the passage about going to the Yale glass blowing shop uh, and telling the, 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 the master glass blower that we wanted uh, to make artificial vaginas for ducks. And I'll, I'll leave that to you to check out. But uh, on the, these are all tubes of the same diameter. We have a straight shot, uh, a counterclockwise coil, a clockwise coil and a dead end cul-de-sac. So these are male-like, simple or male-like, and then female-like. And what we found is that the penis erected at the same speed as air in these glass tubes most of the time, and 80% of the time it failed to fully erect in, 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 in the female tube. So these tubes are nothing like the female vaginal tract, except in shape, showing that we think that these, co -evolved, these shapes have co-evolved in an antagonistic way. So how does this work? Well. Um, what this means is that sexual autonomy matters to animals, that there is something it is like to have freedom of choice, and that there are evolutionary consequences when it is uh, subverted by violence. So when the female selects the male she likes, then her offspring will inherit the green head and the quack, quack, quack that she likes, and that other females have co-evolved to prefer. But if the female is forcibly fertilized, her male offspring will either inherit a random trait or one that she's explicitly rejected, which means that her offspring are less likely to be sexually attractive to other females. Right? So in this case, aesthetic normativity, the idea, the, the standard of beauty which females share, provides them with evolutionary leverage, the opportunity to advance their freedom of choice in the face of persistent sexual violence. Right? Right. So what that Senate candidate uh, from Missouri, Todd Aiken, said about women have a whole way of shutting that whole thing down <laughs> in response to rape is true of ducks. 
but in a way that informs us in it about the nature of sexual autonomy, which is that sexual autonomy is not just an idea invented or discovered by suffragettes and feminists in the 19th and 20th centuries, but is an evolved feature of the social sexual lives of other birds, or other species, including the birds, right? And how did we get here? Because the aesthetic view, this aesthetic view of life takes the subjective experiences of animals seriously and doesn't try to explain them away. And that's really the first time that people have asked, well, what, is it, what, what do the females want? Well, what they want is freedom of choice and that these structures that they evolved are the way of getting it, right? Now, the ducks, unfortunately, are really uh, a downer, right? Uh, there are lots of investment in, 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 in armament on the case of the males and defense or resistance in the case of the females. Everybody does worse off. It's a sexual arms race. But in the case of the... Uh, uh, of, of bower birds, we have birds that follow a different path that teach us a new lesson about sexual autonomy. And this is uh, uh, what I call aesthetic remodeling, a new approach to ways to avoid the arms race. Well, here we have um, uh, a, a satin bower bird, another polygynous species. This is found in Australia and New Guinea, uh, or the family is. And, and the females do all the nesting, and the males build these bowers. The bower is not a nest. It's, uh, it's a kind of seduction theater uh, made out of found objects, in this case sticks, and, and then ornamented with a bunch of stuff, like in this case blue feathers and blue trash and whatnot. And, um, um, and this is another uh, bower bird uh, with the two, two walls. This is called an avenue bower, and that's right where the female sits during the display. And here's his display stuff. You can see in this species they like white things like bones and sticks, but in this case uh, he's using... Um, uh, well, uh, this bower is about two kilometers from the ocean in Western Australia. And on the ocean is a cliff. And in the middle of the cliff is a sort of geological stratum. And in that stratum are fossils, fossil clams. And so this is a pile of fossil clam shells. So this is a curatorial paleontological bower bird, right? As a curator myself, I kind of relate to this guy, I must admit. And he's, 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 uh, when he sings at the top of his tree, as he does in the morning to attract female visitors, he's, he's saying, literally singing, do you want to come over and see my fossil collection? <laughs> well, when she visits, she sits there, right? And then he comes out front, as in this guy, and he, and he gathers things and approaches her. It's actually kind of a, quite a, 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 a violent act of display. But now we see the other features of the bower. Because if the male wants to copulate, he has to go around the back of these two walls. And if the female doesn't like the way it's headed, she can pop out the front. So the bower is aesthetic. It is beautiful. It has architecture. But it also has this other correlated feature, which is that it protects her freedom of choice. So she can get inches away and see him at intimately close distance and all his stuff and his dramatic, even violent displays. But she can preserve her capacity to choose. Right? So how does this happen? The male makes the bower. The males make the bower because the females like them. Why do they like the bowers? They like, like the bowers because they are both beautiful and provide them with the freedom to actually assess that beauty. And we see this in other bower architecture. Here's the maypole bower. It has sort of a Charlie Brown Christmas tree in the middle. And then this, uh, this uh, sort of ditch around the outside. And the male and the female stand opposite each other. And when the male moves, the female just moves to keep the, keep the, 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 the tree between them. It has this, a different architecture, whole new way to get the same protection of sexual autonomy. So then the question leads, what do bowerbirds do with their freedom of choice? And the answer is they choose beauty. In the bowerbirds, we have a great example of aesthetic radiation, a flowering, a diversification of all kinds of architecture and ornamentation, right? So freedom of choice begets beauty in the world. And that is a scientific statement, right? And that is another way when by taking the subjective experiences of animals seriously, we can come up with a whole new way to look at science. Well. Now, in any aesthetic competition, um, 
it's almost guaranteed that the prize, the winning prize will go to the Brazilian team. <laughs> and here is, these are blue mannequins from southeast Brazil. These are unrelated group of mannequins. I, I just want to point out, there is the female on the left. So these males are displaying together in a cooperative form. They are not relatives. Only one of them will copulate, right? The other males are assisting him in attracting the female. They are, why are they doing that? Well, they may someday inherit the perch, but they can't all inherit the perch, obviously, right? Well, it turns out that the females in this species are sexual for about three, five minutes a year. But the males dance in these partnerships for decades, day after day after day, waiting for the chance to inherit the perch, right? So this is maybe the most extreme kind of pre-copulatory cooperation. How does it evolve? Well, uh, this has been studied in another species, a closely related species, uh, a, a Chirizifia, uh, a, 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 of Chirizifia, the long-tailed mannequin, by David McDonald, now at University of Wyoming. Uh, and he, he, these are social networks showing who danced with whom. Uh, and he says that the, um, the uh, network um, uh, McDonald showed that the best predictor of sexual success uh, of young mannequins was... Um, their centrality in the network. That is, it's not about dominance. It's about how many friends do you have, right? I call this bromance before romance, <laughs> right? So um, in this case, um, the female, or the female has, sorry, the female has transformed uh, uh, maleness through selection on those males that get along. Well, why does she prefer males that get along? Well, why not? Right? She's got her three to five minutes of choice during the year, and she uses it. And what she has done is transform maleness utterly into this super cooperative uh, and aesthetic form. Right? So um, that's the you know, extremity of, of, of agency. So um, I hope that I have uh, uh, been able to portray a different view of science, a way where beauty in the natural world is not reduced, not explained away, but explained. And what's fascinating is how rich uh, the outcomes are of taking this uh, Darwinian view of life seriously, uh, this aesthetic view of life. Thank you very much. i uh, really pleasure to talk to you. Uh, so we do have time for a couple of questions, uh, maybe just two or three. If you don't mind coming up to this microphone, um, we are recording, so we'll need to get it caught on a, on a microphone. Um, so if two or three of you want to come up, if you have a burning question, please uh, keep your question in the form of a question. I, I was curious about your comment that 1% um, of, of a given species of bird gets 50% or more of the copulations from the... Um, and that and that's due to the yeah. uh, to the aesthetic, uh, the evolutionary aesthetic that you're talking about. Does that result in um, what I can what I would refer to as best DNA from the survival of the fittest perspective? Well, um, I think that it's actually just another path to decadence. It's both uh, uh, leads to uh, inbreeding most of the individuals being related to those few individuals that are mostly successful. Uh, and it's not a popular subject to study because it leads to a decadent thought. And that is that uh, maybe adaptation by natural selection is not running the show. So uh, that's a really interesting, would be really interesting to study. We've tried to do it and, uh, in my lab, and we found out, uh, surprised, that population genetics is hard. Who knew? Uh, and probably genetics out there. You know it is hard. Anyway, uh, we haven't gotten to the bottom of it, but yes, I think, it, I think it's uh, just decadence. Just decadence happening. There's the, the females in their extremity of choices um, have no interest in the uh, survival of the species. Uh, can what I refer to as best DNA be, be, um, be defined and measured? Uh, well, it, I mean, either through survival and fecundity, which would be natural selection, or through mating success, which would be sexual selection. Um, I'm wondering if you have any idea of why some of these animals 
put invest so much energy in sexual selection and like what you call beauty, whereas a lot of other intelligent animals really don't. Right, and and, and thank you. Great question. Uh, in a in a broader, uh, uh, more responsible scientific setting, I would set the stage with a description of you know behavioral ecology, which is essentially the study of the distribution of resources, where the food is, where the mating opportunities are, the seasonality. So that whole context establishes whether sexual selection is strong or not. I focused, as I said, on aesthetically extreme species, most of whom are polygynous, that is where the females do all the nesting and make choices of the available males. That's where it's maximized. Uh, but there are plenty other cases. Um, and for example, uh, uh, coming here today, I saw an ad for the uh, aquarium with a big puffin on the side of a big bus. And puffins are a great example of monomorphic bright birds. They're both bright. They're having mutual mate choice. They develop these ornaments during the breeding season and they both have preferences for the same thing, right? So that can lead to brilliant uh, penguins or flamingos or other examples. Uh, there can even be polyandrous species where the female is larger, brighter, sing songs uh, like phalaropes or jacanas or plains wanderers. All, uh, there's a whole area where other things can happen. And that's, uh, 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 so there are lots of other examples. Um, and in those cases, there's a low, the smaller amount of beauty when the difference between the most successful and the least sexually successful individuals is, is limited. And that's where you get sparrows uh, and crows, right? <laughs> you alluded to one hypothesis that aesthetic selection could go against the natural selection, so species actually may become instinct. So have there been any documented or discovered cases where that happened? And the second question I have, totally unrelated, obviously one can't resist the temptation of mapping this to human sexuality. And what elements do you think are susceptible or even that, does the framework apply, in other words? Well, uh, I, 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 as long as you've asked, I'll, I'll go back to the slide and say, the last third of the book is about human sexuality. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in two minutes. The last third of the book is about human sexuality. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, what pictures am I going to show? God knows. Uh, so I'm going to use my pro the, the old, boring, professorial bullet point list. So uh, one, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, you know, humans have male choice, female choice, male-male competition, female-female competition, uh, sexual coercion involving male coercion and female coercion, and then culture. So it's not, a, it's not surprising we get it wrong, and the adaptive model has had a real negative impact on human understanding. It's important. Uh, because ad uh, the, the uh, adaptationist view, the Wallisian view, through evolutionary psychology and others, has so impacted uh, view, I think that teenagers grow up today thinking that every asymmetry is revealing of some actual genetic flaws, which is, which is false. It's bad science. So we need an aesthetic view. Uh, it is aesthetic, right? Uh, uh, ornaments in humans have evolved, I think, clearly because they're attractive. It's pleasurable. Uh, the whole area of the reduction, the reductionist view, the explaining away of beauty is correlated with this other side, which is the explaining way of pleasure. There isn't actually an evolutionary theory for the evolution of the extreme, extraordinary pleasure of human sexuality. And so there's a whole chapter in the book on the evolution of orgasm, what's not looked like. And then uh, I think aesthetic remodeling is key in the evolution of humans, and you don't have to look anything further than the human smile to see uh, that uh, males of our immediate closest relatives have deadly weapons in their faces that human males lack. How do you get males to give up their weapons? That's a potent topic in America and political today. <laughs> the, answer, the, the, the answer is you make them unsexy, right? So, so uh, uh, and then lastly, it's diverse. Uh, they're currently evolutionary explanations of the origin of the diversity of sexual attraction in humans, I think is, it, 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 uh, is explaining it away by putting subjective experiences of people at the center of our science, we come up with novel theories of the evolution of same-sex attraction. Uh, so there's a chapter in the book called The Queering of Homo Sapiens, which is exactly about that history in us. Uh, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I think it has a lot to do with, uh, with human sexuality. Uh, just the other one, uh, have there been any cases? Oh yeah, I think actually, I think that club wing mannequin example of decadence is like checkmate. I think this is, and unfortunately, the book got ahead of the peer-reviewed literature, so it's not out yet. I'm working on it right now, but I think that that is an example that no evolutionary biologist can deny, that sexual selection has made everybody in the population worse 
at survival and fecundity, right? And that that's, uh, um, I think that will be, I, I think it'll be the new textbook example. Cool. Thank you. Hi there. Hey. Uh, so you've given us many examples of how ornamentation has co-evolved with female mate choice for the purpose of males being more preferable to females later, ultimately for the purpose of propagating one's genes further, which is often discussed by Richard Dawkins. And in your book, you cite him as a neo wallacean And I'm wondering what you think about that. So um, the context of choice is practical. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that the choices themselves are practical, right? Yes, animals do need to reproduce. So that means that it is uh, in the context of reproduction. Um, uh, but th th their choices are still not about getting better, right? And I would assume that this is similar to the idea, you know, that painters actually sell their paintings. Well, some of them do, right? And, uh, and uh, artists get paid sometimes for their heart, right? And so uh, the fact that there's a practical context doesn't mean that it's not uh, uh, also aesthetic, right? So I think that applies uh, deeply to, to animal choices. Thank you. Thank you. So you've given several examples, like the, the peacock and the bird of paradise, where you say selection for aesthetics may be actually disentangled from selection for um, survival traits. If that is the case, where is female selection coming from? Why are all the females of the species selecting for the same particular aesthetic traits yeah. rather than just selecting randomly on an in individual level? Yeah, you would, you would like the population genetic part that I skipped. <laughs> Basically, so what happens is you know, they, 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 that uh, uh, a norm uh, will arise. So I, I think of this like a spinning top. Uh, mate choice creates forces that propel evolution in a particular way, and the top spins and stays in some place. It will organize itself around something. But over time, it becomes unstable. It will, either in response to uh, intrinsic or extrinsic disturbances, go this way, skitter this way or that way. And if you spin it 10,000 times, it always goes to a different place. And you got 10,000 pieces of birds, and they all got different ideas about what's beautiful, right? So uh, uh, beauty creates a norm, creates normativity. Uh, choice creates normativity, uh, but it's unstable. So one thing that could be rejected in one year uh, uh, in future years becomes the coolest thing, and the whole species evolves in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. This will be our last question. I guess another question almost about the same time frame thing. When you go with the, question, with the example of the club wing mannequin versus its closest, closest relatives having a drastically different bone structure in its wings and makes its whole acoustic repertoire with different instruments, is that, do you think it's more often a case of there's an odd genetic anomaly that birds view as attractive and that spreads throughout the population very quickly, or is it like a longer swing in choice that takes a lot longer over generations yeah, where yeah. preferences are different? Yeah, most of these, most of these uh, polygynous species are members of clades, ancient groups with this long, long history of, of mate choice. So there we have uh, uh, cases of extraordinary aesthetic radiation, everybody going to different places. So um, a, a lot of my early work was actually on understanding the evolution of, of display repertoires over trees. And, and many of these uh, features have evolved originally millions of years ago and are still retained and modified. But that indicates that aesthetics of in nature is like a snowball, right? It keeps rolling and rolling and rolling and goes and, and gets bigger and bigger or more and more elaborate. Or like uh, genres in art where they continue to, to transform and to transform in further ways. And you put something new and suddenly that creates another aesthetic opportunity. So uh, it has many of the same kind of uh, open-ended uh, open properties. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>